All right, thank you so much for all your questions. This, this is amazing. You guys are wonderful. Uh, we have so many questions. I don't know that we're going to be able to answer all of them. Um, we are going to try to, there are a lot of similar questions, and so we're going to try to group those questions. Um, I'll start, and we'll kind of go down the line. So we've tried to put them together. We also have some questions that came from online, and we're going to try to answer some of those too. They're very relevant questions, okay? Um, so I will start off with basically uh, this question, really. So, um, so which would be the symptoms that occur? I, I think what we're talking about is early symptoms that would be like red flags to diagnose a patient with MSA. And I'm just going to go back to the beginning of the talk. I realize it was a long, long session, but I think uh, there are red flags for things that suggest what's not Parkinson's disease, or we call an atypical Parkinson disorder, like multiple system atrophy. And those red flags really are things like, are your symptoms rapidly progressing? Okay, really rapidly. So do you have really severe speech and swallowing issues early on? Are you already in a walker or a cane within the first few three, you know, within the first two or three years? Um, are you responding as well to the typical Parkinson medications? Um, are you trying levodopa? Have you gotten up to a reasonable dose, but it doesn't seem to help your symptoms? These are relatively, these are relative red flags um, for multiple system atrophy. Other thing that you might have are some, we call those plus symptoms. So um, problems with the control of the automatic nervous system, things like bowel, bladder control, blood pressure, um, highs and lows, okay, as we talked about, um, sleep issues, all of those things that are affected by multiple system atrophy. Um, so more than what you'd see normally in Parkinson's disease. So I hope that answers the, the question. Um, again, I want to emphasize, if you have some of those red flags and your neurologist or, or physician starting to question, that should cue you to see a specialist, okay? And in particular, see a movement disorder specialist like myself, Dr. Rodriguez, um, and fi seek out clinics that actually know about this disease. Um, this is a relatively rare disease compared to Parkinson's disease, and we really encourage you to see a specialist to get a diagnosis, because time to diagnosis is one of the things that we really like to reduce, so that we can get you the best treatment, get the right diagnosis, and get you into uh, you know the right medications, the right treatment, and even studies. Okay. So. I think I'm going to answer uh, the first question. I'm going to answer is. Um, the question, there were many questions about pain in multiple system atrophy and nobody addressed it, so I thought I would uh, uh, address it. Uh, yeah, my husband, here's a, just one example. My husband has a primary symptom of severe neuropathic pain, describes this as feeling like his bones are being shattered from the inside. His neuro... Oh, my husband, oh, wow, I can hear myself now. Uh, my husband has, so I, I was going to address the issue of pain in multiple system atrophy because it hasn't been addressed at all. Um, my husband has a primary symptom of severe neuropathic pain. He describes this as feeling like his bones are being shattered from the inside. Is neuropathic pain studied with MSA? If so what treatment is recommended? So um, the answer is that, uh, and there were many questions like that, so a whole bunch about pain. So my, actually, my area of research is in the relationship between the autonomic nervous system and pain, but it's in a whole different population. It's in women that have pelvic pain. But there are some very deep interfaces between uh, autonomic function and pain. And I think the, the, the best answer I can give you is that pain seems like it's a feeling, but it's actually not. Pain is a threat signal. It's a signal to your body that you're being threatened and it's generated by deep centers in the brain. And it's better thought of like a sensation like perhaps hunger or thirst than it is a feeling, a, a, a feeling like you're touching something. Even though it sort of feels that way, that's not actually what it is. And the best analogy I can give is your house alarm system. So your house alarm system has typically a signal like you have a motion detector and that signal sends, is, if it gets to, if you detect an intruder, that signal goes to the central processor. Now the central processor detects the alarm. And our medical science has really too long thought of pain as being the intruder and that signal going off and think of that's pain. Well, no, that's not pain because you put the system on bypass, 
then you get no alarm. Uh, right? If you, put your, if you put your house system on, on bypass, then that intruder signal doesn't trigger any alarm. We have to start thinking of pain as being the alarm. And so that means pain is primarily an experience that is in your brain. Yes, there's a signal, but the pain is in your brain. So in order to manage that, you really need uh, two or three things are critical. One is as best exercise program you can get. Second is what's called cognitive behavioral therapy that manages how your brain is handling that signal. And then, yes, you can also do things to handle the signal, like anti-epileptic medications such as gabapentin or sometimes drugs like tricyclic antidepressants. But I want to emphasize again that the pharmacologic stuff is not that powerful, and that's how we got into the opioid crisis, because we had this mythologic dream that somehow we could eradicate this signal. You can't. You have to deal with the processor. You have to deal with the central processor, and that's where you get most of your power, but that takes time and that takes effort. Yeah. All righty, so... Uh Let's go ahead. I, I had a question here. Okay, so so the first question I have here is, uh, does levodopa help with all MSA symptoms? And the answer to that is uh, technically no. It does not help with all uh, MSA symptoms. Remember that most of the medications and the medica or the medications that we use to treat MSA comes from the Parkinson disease world, right? So. In the early stages of MSA, you know, year one, two, and three in particular, we can see that, uh, that the tremors, if present, might improve with the uh, medications, the stiffness, the slowness. However, once we reach the fourth or fifth year into the MSA, some patients might start losing some of that benefit that they were getting until eventually uh, uh, they might lose most of it. However, however, this is what I ask my patients to do when we talk about medications. In first place, I, I give them the medication and we try to push the dose of the medication as high as we can. And then I ask them, pay attention to see what symptoms you find to be improving. I keep them in that dose for about four to six weeks. That's the fair trial of the medication at a good dosage. If at that time they come back to my clinic and they tell me, you know what, doctor, I tried the medication and the medication is not working. So I still have another trick. I actually begin to take, taper the medication down slowly. Because sometimes when they go down on the dose of the medication, at that point they will say, oh my, you know, I see that my balance is now getting worse as I am decreasing the dosage of the uh, carbidopa, uh, uh, levodopa. So it might be that the medication might be helping to some extent with, uh, uh, with the balance issue. So, so once again, the, the experience from each patient is going to be a little bit different. My personal opinion of why we should push on the, on the levodopa to, you know, to a decent dosage is because balance in particular may get a little bit better. That will be my, my main goal. Is this going to happen to everybody? No, it's not going to happen to everybody. But those that will get that benefit, obviously, it, it, can, be, uh, uh, it can improve the quality of life in the long term by avoiding falls and so on. So, um, so, so everybody will have a little bit of a different uh, benefit from the medication. Got a question uh, about what to do once uh, the traditional interventions like fiber, laxatives, uh, and those type of over-the-counter medications have failed. Um, so this particular uh, person that wrote the question was already taking one or two uh, fleet suppositories uh, each week. So for this particular problem, one of the main forgotten things is that the main culprit may not be at the beginning that the colon is sluggish. The problem may be that the outlet is not working well, and we call that the synergic defecation, which is basically your colon that is not well coordinated with the sphincters and the pelvic floor to have a nice bowel movement. When you uh, let that pattern Unrecognized for 
years and years, then that's when you end with a mega colon or a large colon that will not work. And then the good news is that you recognize that early, uh, based on research, up to 75% of patients that go to pelvic floor physical therapy, similar to that Kegels do for the bladder, but aim to bowel movements, uh, will help dramatically. So um, in our general GI patients, uh, and uh, the very first thing that we do when when you fail the traditional investigation is to do anorectal manometry, and anorectal manometry will measure the bottom part of the of the gut, meaning the rectum, and it's going to measure your rectal sensation because that's also very important to have bowel movements, and it's going to measure your sphincter tone. Then, when you do that test, you can get numbers from each of these individual uh, patterns that are very important. Then. Based on that information, you can uh, go to physical therapy, requesting the therapist to help you with the the, the abdominal uh, contractions that you need to do with your muscles that are voluntary to facilitate bowel movements. Uh, likewise, they can help you to feel stool better. That's called rectal perception. And then they also can give you exercises to relax the anal sphincter. So in addition to the laxatives and the fiber, and all of the other things, it's always very important to do anorectal manometry to document what is the problem, and then based on that, likely you're going to benefit from going to physical therapy. Then, uh, if you've, you know, your disease continued to progress, and 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 you already done f this type of physical therapy. Um, then there is nothing wrong with, with, with facilitating bowel movements. You can have enemas, uh, you, can, you can have uh, uh, stimulant laxatives that will force your colon to contract. Uh, you can generate kind of a routine and a pattern in which you, know, you wake up, um, you eat something, you may have coffee that is going to uh, wake up the colon as well. Then you can do massage of the abdomen that also facilitates some of the contractions. Then at a specific time, you see in the toilet. Uh, and you may use uh, um, glycerin or water suppositories that are, you know, are going to make your, your rectum contract as well. And you kind of adoctrinate or teach your body to have a bowel movement, uh, and that helps a lot. So uh, there are there are means to help with constipation, and unfortunately, the the, the physical therapy, the outer part. Uh, the, the anal sphincter that needs to relax is, is frequently forgotten in the therapy of, of constipation, not only for you, uh, but for general GI patients as well. So um, that's very important. I will recommend uh, the patients that have severe constipation to be tested and uh, to get physical therapy because that's likely going to be very beneficial. Um. <clears throat> Uh, received a number of different questions uh, about something I didn't come across in my talk for uh, ur urology and the bladder as far as MSA goes, and that's uh, a lot of questions about uh, urinary tract infections, uh, prevention of urinary tract infections, why urinary tract infections, catheters in urinary tract infections. Um, and so I'll, I'll just start off by saying that there's very little, there's very few studies looking specifically in this population group about urinary tract infections. And obviously, it's UTIs uh, affect uh, the whole spectrum of, of patients, uh, both uh, with neurologic disease, without. Um, and and it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing to, to deal with, clearly. I mean, it's a, it's a multi-billion dollar problem, really, in the United States uh, with the number of offices, et cetera. Um, so when patients have, you know, as far as uh, if you have recurrent urine tract infections and you haven't been evaluated for it, typically the evaluation from a urologist is going to be a combination of making sure there's no anatomic problems, so anatomic reasons for why you should have them. Those would include issues with making sure the kidneys are draining normally and the bladder's draining normally. So patients with MSA may be more prone to UTIs because of incomplete bladder emptying uh, or the bladder just not draining as well as it could, so that could be an issue. We also like to rule out things like other sort of sources such as you know uh, any kind of foreign bodies in the uh, urinary system or uh, stones in the urinary system. And that would be an issue. Um, as far as, once again, patients with who have incomplete bladder emptying, many of them may have catheters. They could have a, do intermittent catheterization. They may have an indwelling Foley catheter or urethral catheter. They also could have a suprapubic catheter. So all these things are uh, 
also they, they obviously help drain the bladder, but at the same time, it, it's like everything, there's no perfect system. They help drain the bladder, but there's also now a foreign body sort of in the urinary system. So it's a, it's a catch, right? We want to empty the bladder, but at the same time, sometimes the only way to do that is to stick a foreign body in there. And that can be, uh, that, sh that can actually work against us too in some patients. Um, as far as uh, prophylaxis or what you can do, um, most of it's going to be, you know, if, if assuming everything otherwise is normal and everything is coming out, uh, no obvious abnormalities, um, it's going to be oftentimes medical treatment. And what I mean by that is, uh, so patients who say don't have a catheter and who have lots of infections, um, there's different uh, treatments with obviously treating the, uh, is, is, is treating them by sort of self-treatment programs where patients will actually be given antibiotics and sort of taught to sort of monitor their urine. And, and, and treat as necessary when they have symptoms of an infection or even uh, with uh, urine dipsticks. Uh, other things can be uh, things where patients will take prophylactic antibiotics or a daily or, or every other day, maybe even weekly antibiotic, if that seems to be a cause for the urinary tract infection. So being on a, as a prolonged course of an antibiotic can also be another option. As far as medications and other things beyond that, um, those are going to be the things that are best studied to look at preventing infections. There are other things that we talk about. You probably hear about like cranberry, d mannose, probiotics. Um, there's, there is some data to suggest that some of these things may be helpful, but there's not a lot. So these are what I consider sort of things that uh, they probably don't hurt most patients. There is some, uh, once again, data to suggest they may be helpful, but it's, cl it's not clear cut in any person. So once again, we always look at medicine choosing anything. We look at the risk benefit and, you know, I think the risk is fairly low. The benefit could be high. Um, those things could be options. Um, slightly more, uh, more involved would be th things like methenamine or Hiprex. This is a medication uh, that's been used before that's hydrolyzed in the urine and becomes a combination of ammonia and formaldehyde and may uh, it's more bacteriostatic, and for some patients, once again, it uh, can be helpful in trying to decrease or minimize urinary tract infections, but certainly not a home run in every, in every uh, patient. So unfortunately, this is a real difficult problem across the whole spectrum of patients uh, for, for UTIs. Okay, hard to pick. Um, I'm going to answer just a couple of quick questions actually here. Um, someone asked me about, or asked us about the difference between MSA Parkinson's and MSA C or the cerebellar time in terms of pathology. Um, so I'm almost going to defer that to Dr. Dixon way in the back, but um, similar pathology occurs in both diseases. They both have what's called these glial cytoplasmic inclusions. Um, so the pathology is similar. It's really the symptoms and the basically the phenotype, how they present that's different, okay? All right, so I want to emphasize that. The reason we kind of called them all multiple system atrophy is because of the similarities of pathology. So we believe that there's a similar mechanism. We still yet don't understand, though, how that pathology gives you two different kinds of phenotypes, okay? That's sort of one of those major questions that we're still trying to um, battle with. Um, the other thing was really a question about uh, Path, or sort of the diagnostic categories. Um, it is true that as clinicians, we currently have diagnostic criteria for multiple system atrophy, and the best we can do as clinicians while you're alive is to tell you whether you have possible or probable multiple system atrophy. Okay. Unfortunately, a definitive diagnosis is really left to pathology, so it's really an autopsy diagnosis. Um, you know, that's uh, unfortunate, really. Um, at this stage, we still need to look for what are called biomarkers, things we can measure in the blood or brain or imaging. There's currently no one thing that we actually have that gives us a definitive diagnosis when you're alive. So that's something we're struggling for and uh, a research question we really have. Um, in terms of our accuracy, um, you know, I will admit um, we do our best as clinicians to make this diagnosis and um, we are trying to make the best, be most accurate diagnosis we can. We do get it wrong sometimes. Um, even the best of us do get it wrong. Um, and pathologically, I think we've seen that almost 40% of the time we do actually do get the wrong pathologic, uh, di or based on pathology, the wrong diagnosis. Um, like I said at the beginning, there is overlap with Parkinson's disease, ataxic disorders, 
and even other mimickers, okay? Um, but we are doing the best we can with the knowledge that we actually have, and that's why it's so important not just to see you in our clinics, um, but also to follow you over time to try to help you um, with this. Okay, so let me pass. Uh, I'm also going to uh, try to get a couple of quick questions out of the way. So one is, um, are there any cardiac electrophysiologists that work with MSA patients? Typically not. Typically you need to have... Uh, there's a question about atrial fibrillation and some other issues with the heart. Typically, you need to have an autonomic neurologist and a cardiologist work together. So I would typically be in communication with the cardiologist, and we would talk together about what the autonomic picture in a particular patient may be, and what's the cardiac picture, and what's the best way to approach this. And I think you need, you need both together to work this out. Uh, then there's a bunch of questions that are really quite similar uh, on blood pressure changes, ups and downs, fluctuations, blood pressure that's difficult to manage. I'm going to try to address those all together. So um, if your blood pressure fluctuates, sometimes it's 60, sometimes it's 220s, of course, the very first thing to do is change your position. So if you're, if you're lying flat and your blood pressure is high, then you just kind of sit up a little bit. If you're standing and blood pressure is low, then you naturally typically will get a, you may get a signal that you're lightheaded, but you may not. Uh, so it's very important that you be in tune with your body. Your signal may actually be something very strange, like I've had one patient who developed toe pain when the blood pressure dropped. More common signals are things like you could have sort of a coat hanger feeling around your shoulders or a sense of fatigue. You're just not feeling right, but it's not lightheaded or dizziness. Try to, try to identify what signal you have, and then you know without checking your blood pressure, okay, it's time I need to sit or I need to lie flat. Now, if those things don't work, there are ways of managing highs and lows, and if, the, if your highs and lows are kind of quick, like they last a half an hour or an hour, for a high, you can use a little bit of nitro paste. You just sort of put it on your chest, and then as soon as your blood pressure, it'll cause your blood pressure to drop pretty quickly, over about five minutes or so, you monitor your blood pressure, and when that high is gone, you just wipe that paste off. And there's other rapid-acting medications you can use. Before you get a, go to bed, if you need to take something, you typically take something like uh, Captopril, which is, an, uh, which is a um, uh, angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitor, this kind of fast-acting. It'll last maybe six or seven hours. Uh, beta blockers can sometimes be very helpful around the clock, actually, because they both have uh, a drop pressure effect, but they also can increase venous pressure, which is very helpful to increase how much blood pressure, how much blood gets back to your heart. Uh, along those lines was postprandial hypotension. So yeah, the, the, the biggest stimulus to increase blood pressure is the one I showed you on my slide, which is water. The biggest stimulus to drop blood pressure is food. And so frequent small meals will help with that, or you just want to take Precautions. You just want to know when I'm going to eat, my blood pressure is going to drop. I'm quoting David Robertson uh, when I say this, but uh, he, a lot of data shows that those are the two biggest stimuli that we can control um, to blood pressure. Uh, and the last quick question is, can orthostatic hypotension start years before other symptoms in MSA? And the answer is absolutely yes. You can have just a problem with blood pressure, or just a problem with your bladder, or just a problem with swallowing, or just a problem with sleep that could go on five or even ten years before you develop some of the more classic motor symptoms. All righty, those were great tricks, actually. That was really nice. Going to put some in my clinic. So, uh, you know, what I'll do is same thing. I, I will tackle some, some of the questions. And what I will do instead of just reading the, the, the question, I'll just summarize, and the answers are going to, to be there. Actually, in, there's a great comment. I think that this one came from the, uh, the people watching online. As a caregiver, you know, what symptoms should uh, be of most concern? Okay? This is what I tell people in my clinic. There are two things that I ask my, my caregivers to watch on their patients. Number one is, falls, okay? Falling down, uh, breaking something is going to cause a problem because likely the patient will end up in the hospital. I am very sure that in the hospital they will try but they won't give the same care that they are able to take at home. So things will be complicated and there's a chance for hallucinations, confusion and so forth. So what should be a 24 hours admission can become three or four days and then follow up at the uh, rehab center. The other thing is uh, 
trouble swallowing. Okay, so typically uh, the way to recognize this is when they are uh, eating or drinking, there can be a little bit of a cough. Okay, so that's the time to go to the doctor and have this address. You know, I was having a conversation with one of you last night where I was telling them that many times the patient comes after they already had the aspiration pneumonia and everything has broken down and trying to fix that up can be very difficult. But if you come early and you have your appointments with your doctor, because your doctor, his job is to try to identify those early signals of things that will get you in trouble for your doctor to be able to address, okay? So that's very critical, but two things, falls and trouble swallowing. Then uh, the next one, I actually have a, a <laughs> this, this is a great question. I am going to give you what is my opinion. I don't have data on this, but this is my opinion. So the question is, you know, are we seeing more Parkinsonism? Are we seeing more Parkinson's? Are we seeing more MSA? And why is this happening, right? So I'm going to, to tell you what I think. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a strong believer that, you know, all the pesticides and the chemicals that we have in our food chain might have a big impact in this, okay? So when people ask me about this, I tell them, listen, if you can afford to eat organics, eat organics. If you can afford to have um, a, a small garden in, in your house, go ahead and have it, okay? Um, and know that, you know, eating organics and all that stuff is more expensive, but my belief is this. Some people carry a predisposition to develop these conditions, right? It's like, just another analogy, it's like carrying a gun, right? And your gun can be a Smith & Wesson, you can have another, I don't, I don't know about guns, but there are multiple, you know, Magnum or whatever, right? So something is gonna pull the trigger for that gun. So I, I'm a strong believer that the diet and the pesticides are it, right? So I tell my patients, listen, you either pay at it at the grocery store now, or you're gonna pay at it at the doctor later in life. So if you can afford to eat organics, eat organics, or grow a few things in your backyard just to make things a little bit easier, and then follow a healthy lifestyle of exercise, um, you know, read, you know, keep your mind busy, socialize, sleep well, and then, you know, try to uh, minimize stress. I'm strong on me meditation as well as part of a treatment option. Then the other thing is about uh, uh, other formulations of levodopa, and, and there's a question about whether there is a sublingual form of um, uh, levodopa, and there's something called Parcopa, P-A-R-C-O-A-P, which is a, it's a, it's a dissolved under the tongue version of levodopa, but it still goes down to the stomach to be absorbed. So there's not truly sublingual, but if you have problems swallowing, that can be a really good option. And then I have another question about using uh, Ritari. Ritari is another version of carbidopa levodopa. So yes, it will be okay to, to use. Uh, I just don't want you to lose your house on trying to afford some of these medications because this is definitely more expensive. But if your insurance is paying for it and you don't have any problems, so this will be a better version of um, levodopa. And then um, another great question, and this is going to be the last one I'm going to answer for now, is uh, how do we distinguish uh, a myopathy versus a dystonia for the forward neck or head tilt, right? So uh, the way that I do this is, I, I have a friend, he is a neurologist that specializes in muscular disorders. And obviously I took my history, I have the suspicion that this might not be a true dystonia, but a problem in the neck. So my friend, what he will do is, he will stick a needle, and that needle is connected to uh, an oscilloscope that we can see how healthy is the electrical signal coming from that muscle. If the problem is in the muscle, the electrical signal is going to be small and very faint. If the muscle is healthy, then it will look like a totally normal signal. So that is the way that we can uh, differentiate one uh, condition versus the other. I, I'm gonna follow your concerns about uh, the environment and uh, there were a few questions about uh, how significant is the gut as the breaking ground for MSA and uh, research highlight uh, about the brain gun link in neurologic disorders. Uh, so, uh, in terms of research, one of the, the the grounds that is is being studied more actively in the GI establishment is uh, what we call the microbiome, and that's kind of an umbrella term that basically mentions the good bacteria that you have in your gut. Then. 
there is something called dysbiosis, which means that that good interaction that you get with the bacteria gets disrupted and is abnormal, it becomes pathologic. So microbiome and dysbiosis changing the composition of this good and bad bacteria can induce significant health problems. And one of those uh, problems uh, have been linked with neurologic disorders. So um, bacteria can uh, make proteins. And one of, one of those type of proteins um, is called prions uh, that are associated with various neurologic disorders. Those proteins can mimic, can disguise as your own proteins. And one of the few organs or, or cells or, or, or uh, tissues that can transmit or carry these proteins are the nerves. Because of the milieu of the nerve that is fatty, uh, you know, one of the theories or the hypothesis is that these uh, things that come uh, through your gut, things that you eat, uh, that are modified by bacteria and making this change that becomes pathologic can be transmitted to the brain and you know when when it becomes similar uh, although it's similar it may not be quite uh, good as your own protein and our immune system uh, learns how to react to those so one of the theories could it be that uh, these uh, abnormal substances made uh, by bacteria can travel to the to the brain or to the neurologic cells, and then your own system, your immune cells, will attack uh, those proteins and damage the tissue around. So it's only a hypothesis, only a theory, but uh, you know I don't think it's, it's, it's a crazy theory. It's, it's a lot of data that suggests that there is a lot of interactions that we are not even aware. Then the other issue, the other frequency, uh, or um, uh, a lot of enthusiasm in, in terms of research, is that uh, bacteria also uh, produce gas, and one of those gas that is produced by bacteria is methane. And methane uh, is a gas that is, is easily absorbed by the bloodstream. Then methane can get from the bloodstream into your brain and can make you sluggish and can worsen sluggish and like what is called brain fog, and that seems to be very common in patients with problems like constipation. So in fact, we have uh, patients that have predominant constipation that have a predominant methane producing bacteria that if they are not treated they will perpetuate the cycle of constipation and they will also give you a theoretical uh, uh, make you more prone to develop this brain fog so there are many ways in which the, the gut and the brain interactions can give you worse uh, perception of symptoms and definitely uh, could be even part of the Oh, one of the causes for for this for these diseases. So this is in addition to the the chemicals that you that you can ingest with food. Then you also ingest bacteria that you know they are very active in terms of of uh, interacting with your organ and and giving you good or bad things. All right. Also had a number of questions about sort of incontinence and some of the treatments. Um, so why incontinence in patients? Um, usually, you know, very simply, uh, we think of sort of the bladder as a low pressure storage reservoir. So any problems with that, whether it's spasticity of the bladder wall, so it's contracting when it shouldn't, so normally you shouldn't contract until you want to urinate, and then that will cause the bladder to empty, but sometimes people will have involuntary contractions of this bladder wall, which causes leakage. It can be due to the bladder wall itself becoming poorly compliant, so it doesn't stretch like it normally should. It should be fairly elastic and stretch up, and if it doesn't do that well, that can cause leakage. Um, it can also be due to something, we have a urinary sphincter, so this is uh, usually a voluntarily controlled muscle which basically uh, will help hold in the urine. If that becomes weakened over time, you can have leakage that way also. Um, and a fourth way is really, in some patients that you may see are patients who don't empty their bladder well, they actually develop what they call overflow incontinence, where their bladder becomes so full because they empty so poorly that it just starts to, it's trying to find its way out of the bladder and it starts to leak out of the bladder, so what they call overflow incontinence. And so management, the most common thing we're going to see in patients uh, with MSA are going to be things like um, uh, uh, bladder overactivity or diffuser overactivity. 
Um, these are often treated, as I mentioned uh, very briefly in my talk before, with a group of uh, anti-muscarinics or anticholinergic medications. Someone asked, is there a best one? No, there is no best one. Um, all of them can be affected. These are the drugs that you probably, many may have heard of, like oxybutynin, solafenacin, trospium. Um, so there's a, a whole host of them that are out there, but there's not one that's been shown to be better than the other, really. Um, they have a, a significant number of side effects um, in some patients, and there is some suggestion that some of the single dosing ones may have fewer side effects than the ones that are dosed multiple times per day. Um, there is another class of drugs. Uh, someone asked, is Mirabetric uh, one that people can use? Sure, that's a sort of a slightly newer class. It's a beta-3 agonist, which causes direct relaxation of the bladder wall. Um, and this can be tolerated a bit better in some patients, but, uh, but patients with MSA certainly could try that. Obviously, if they had any problems, they would discontinue it. And then, um, for overflow incontinence, someone asked something about a uro lift, and this is actually a prostate procedure to open up the prostate uh, to allow patients to urinate better, and maybe this would help. And it may be helpful as long as they're um, evaluated properly or thoroughly to make sure that that's an, that the prostate is actually a pro the problem that's causing some type of obstructive issue and not necessarily someone with a bladder that's poorly functioning. Because if the bladder is poorly functioning, opening up the prostate doesn't really do much. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to try to answer some of these. Uh, there are a bunch of sleep questions. They are pretty much re uh, related here. Um, so uh, snoring, sleep apnea, were a couple of questions here actually. So um, just because you snore doesn't mean that you have sleep apnea, okay? Um, but if your partner does snore, you, you may want to watch out for what we call apneic periods. These are periods where they actually, they may snore, but they stop breathing. So sleep apnea is when you really stop breathing. So you may just hold off, and then they may breathe rapidly, quickly again to kind of you know, get the oxygen back in. So listen for that. Um, it really takes a sleep study to diagnose sleep apnea, and people can actually have multiple apnea events, and so it can vary in severity. So um, this can be pro a prodromal, a symptom that's before diagnosis. It can be a symptom of MSA, during MSA, either way. But regardless, really, it's something that needs to be evaluated and treated. Uh, like I said in the brief talk from Dr. Skinner, um, it can be treated with what's called continuous positive airway pressure, or called CPAP. All right, obstructive sleep apnea is an obstructive problem in the throat, okay? Um, in some patients, this can also be a central disordered breathing pattern, okay, or we call central sleep apnea, okay? Um, and those patients um, may be more complicated in terms of uh, how to regulate their sleep. So a continuous positive airway pressure may not be enough because it's, a, it's not an obstructive problem, it's a central problem in the brain telling you, uh, you know, sort of disrupted sleep, that pattern of, uh, sorry, disrupted breathing, okay, controlled by the brain. In that case, a more complicated kind of breathing arrangement needs to be done. So often patients use things like BiPAP or what's called AutoPAP um, to treat that, okay. Um, who do you go to for this? Uh, you have a couple options. I mean, clearly if you have a neurologist, tell your neurologist, okay, about this. And we can actually refer you to either a, a sleep neurologist or a pulmonary physician um, who can do the evaluation. Your family physician or primary care physician can also do the same thing and help manage um, these things. Um, I usually do recommend, especially with patients who have more complicated sleep issues, that they do see a sleep neurologist or a pulmonologist and to be managed, because it can get kind of complicated um, for patients. It's really important that it gets treated, because um, it can affect your overall health, um, your quality of daytime. Um, you know, the other question that was led to this was really the excessive daytime sleep. So if you're not getting a good night's sleep because you're having these apneic events and arousals throughout the night, you're going to have uh, excessive daytime sleepiness. This is a really major problem um, for, for patients. Um, there's a difference, though, I do want to make up uh, or explain to patients. So um, daytime somnolence is where you feels like you're going to sleep and you take lots of naps, okay? You fall asleep and if it's bad enough, it can be falling asleep during conversations or during meals, okay? And that becomes really disruptive and that needs to be treated. But there's a difference between being somnolent or falling asleep to then uh, compared to what's just fatigue, okay? Fatigue or feeling like you have no energy, okay, all the time. 
This is unfortunately a very common symptom of Parkinson's disorders, and it tends to be extremely difficult to treat. We really currently don't have any good medications to treat fatigue, uh, per se. We do have good medications to keep people awake. Those are stimulants, okay? Um, things like Provigil, New Vigil, there are amphetamines or other things um, that can keep people awake. They obviously have drawbacks, okay, and sometimes are well tolerated. Some of them are very expensive. Amphetamines are controlled substances, just like narcotics, um, so not easy to get. Um, do talk to your physician about it. We can try to treat. Um, there are other medications that can be used. Um, on the flip side also, um, it's important for us as physicians and neurologists to look at your medications to make sure if something that uh, any of those medications are actually contributing to your fatigue as well. Because a lot of medications we use, including the levodopa, um, that's the most common medication used for Parkinson's, can, can cause fatigue and somnolence in patients. So sometimes it's just a matter of balancing what we're giving you to treat your Parkinson's symptoms with those adverse or side effects of those medications. And that's the best thing we can do uh, for you. So talk to your docs. Okay. Thanks, very nice. Um, so a couple more quick questions. Uh, one was, um, are size part of MSA? Yes, definitely. Uh, the um, breathing centers are significantly affected. They're very closely linked to the sleep centers that were just being talked about. And yes, size can be uh, a, a part of MSA. Um, do we need autonomic testing to diagnose orthostatic hypotension? No, not at all. You can do it in the office and a blood pressure lying and a blood pressure standing. Typically take it immediately and then take it again at about three minutes and see what the trend is. And if that blood pressure is dropping across those three minutes from the values you got with lying flat, you have orthostatic hypotension. Can you prove that it's neurogenic just at the bedside? No, you can't, but I think you don't need to prove it. Uh, so that, that's an easy one. Uh, what about very, very unresponsive orthostatic hypotension? It doesn't respond to anything. Um, so one thing that's, uh, the gut is affected in um, orthostatic hypotension, and so this particular person was going to the emergency room all the time. Well, what do they do in the emergency room? They give you IV fluids, and then that, that works. So. If IV fluids work and yet uh, fluids and salt you're taking by mouth aren't working, it tells you the gut's not absorbing. So in that particular situation, I typically will do a 24-hour urine sodium, very cheap test to just measure how much sodium the person is actually absorbing. And that's why I'm, I, on my slide I said sometimes up to 15 grams per day. It's not that they all that stuff is going into their bloodstream, it's just they're absorbing so poorly that they get the four or five grams when you give them the 15 grams. So you gotta do the 24 hour urine sodium. That's the most likely in this particular case, the problem is the person is not absorbing the salts, so the other drugs are simply not working. And when they go to the emergency room, what do they do? Well, they just bypass the gut. They give salt and fluid through the veins. Um, and then there was a question, will fludrocortisone eventually quit being effective? Fludrocortisone is a good drug, typically will not, but the disease will eventually progress to the point where it's no longer compensating for the problem. Again, for this person who's on 0.6 milligrams a day of fludrocortisone, I would check a 24-hour urine sodium and see whether you're absorbing it. I, I, I do think there's a huge amount of drug absorption issues in MSA that relate to the autonomic impact on the gut that we are not, as doctors, all that mindful of. Um, and. Um, Okay, this is more of a research question. Iodized salt, um, you don't need iodized salt. In fact, if you're taking a lot of salt, like 15 grams a day, it's possible you're absorbing the iodine more than you're absorbing the sodium. So I would try to just take your regular quotient of iodized salt in your food, and then you probably use non-iodized salt for your supplements. Otherwise, you could actually get too much iodine. Chelation therapy, we have no idea about because we really don't know what causes MSA. Uh, there's no evidence that it does work and no evidence that it does not work. And then there was a general question about body temperature dysregulation, which is it's a big, huge topic, and I'm not going to address the whole thing, just to say that the exact same problem we have with the barrel reflex, meaning that you can't get blood pressure up when it's down, you can't get blood pressure down when it's up, is the same issue we have with body temperature regulation. You can't get the body temperature up when you need it and down when you, when you don't need it. Um, and how do you manage it? Well, you just do things like uh, you try to become 
your brain's nervous system yourself. So if you're hot, you can spray some water on your body. If you're out on a hot day, uh, you're not gonna sweat because your sweat glands are not properly being controlled. So you sweat for yourself. You take a little bottle of spray and you cool yourself down. If you're, um, uh, if it's the opposite problem and you're cold, then you just have to keep putting on um, sweaters and blankets until you until you warm up. I, I don't have a better, better answer. Those of you who had research questions, we're not throwing them out. We're going to hold them for the research panel too, and hopefully we'll have some time to answer those too. Thanks so much.